We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. And today we're really lucky and honored to have with us James Johnson of Sun Consulting from Limerick, Pennsylvania. James, welcome. Uh, Thank you. you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and uh, how you got your values, and what led you into organizing for justice. Sure, I'll be more than happy to. You know, I've started, gosh, I was born in Philadelphia, and then kind of in Limerick is a little bit outside of uh, Pens uh, Philadelphia, and so it's finally like a a complete circle for me because I, I, even though I was born in Philadelphia, was raised in South Carolina on a small farm. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it a farm because we had pigs and and other animals, chickens and so forth. But uh, um, and learned a lot from growing up there. I, I grew up with my grandparents, and they taught me a lot about you know being polite. Um, they taught me what folks say about me that Southern hospitality or Southern manners. Um, and so I learned a lot from them growing up in the house with them. Um, I'm the oldest of, um, of seven children, um, or eight children. I'm one of those, right? Uh, and so I had a lot of time to really watch them grow and they are still growing up and we're growing, growing up together now. But I think what it was, uh, Michael, was that coming from a big family, I got used to being around a lot of people, mm -hmm. and I think uh, throughout life, it, I just ended up loving just being around people, yeah. just loving people, and just seeing the good in people. And, and I mm -hmm. think that's one of the things about community organizing itself is that you start to learn, you know, that, you know, people are just basically good people, and people are trying to, you know, get ahead just like everyone else in society. And so um, a lot of things out there really um, slows people down from getting to, to meet their dreams and so forth. And so we have this opportunity um, by growing up and getting to know people and know how people tick and so forth that we have an opportunity to make certain changes in society. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things I started to learn when I was growing up with the big family. We didn't have a lot of money or a lot of resources, but we had each other. Mm -hmm. We had the neighborhood. You know, if one of us didn't have this, a neighbor had it. And we didn't mind sharing mm -hmm. things with each other like that. So um, after South Carolina, I went to school. And my degrees are in music. So. Right. Um, being in, when people ask me, how in the world you got into organizing, right. you know, when you were a musician, and, and I still call myself a musician yeah. today, but I learned something along the way in organizing that, that spirit, that spirit of song, mm. you know, being able to go to a rally and you have your own songs and you're singing them and, you know, mm. you're marching to them and, and, and everyone feels that sense of connectedness. Mm. Some of the things that you learn when you're doing organizing, that whole thing around being connected with each other. And so 
uh, going to college in music helped me, you know, to mm. figure out the spiritual um, f uh, mm. side of this. And I thought that was really key. That um, and this is before I was an organizer, you know. Mm -hmm. that, but I always realized that when I did become an organizer, that I had this kind of flame, eternal flame here mm. inside of me. Mm -hmm. And so the music part of that, uh, part of my career helped me with that. And then eventually moved to Western New York. Um, and what I started to do after graduate school was I wanted to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. And so walking down the street um, in, in Chautauqua County, uh, in Dunkirk, New York, mm -hmm. and saw this building, it looked like a food ministry. And then I saw the sign on it says United Way, see, a big brand. Yeah. Um, and I said, it's a United Way agency. I should see if I can go volunteer for them. Huh. And I went, and sure enough, I became a volunteer for them. And working in the strawberry fields while I'm volunteering there, hmm. um, that's how I was making my rent hmm. back in the day. And so, um, so as I'm doing volunteering work there with their food pantry and so forth, and I noticed something in the strawberry fields that we had a lot of migrant workers, and they were always happy. You know, I'm sitting here, really? my back is hurting, you know, bending over trying to pick strawberries. Not an easy job, but they were just always happy. They're singing in the fields, they're dancing in the fields, and I just loved the spirit that they had. They, they weren't making a lot of money, but they were just happy. Hmm. You know, they could live with what they had, but hmm. they had each other. And so hmm. that got me to thinking about things as well. Hmm. And so, when I was doing the work with uh, the rural ministry, um, they had this one um, opening for, it was called the People's Action Coalition. Hmm. And so what they did, they advocate for people's rights. And, and I just, at the time, this is when I'm starting to grow. I'm like, oh, it's just a bunch of people getting together to make a fuss. Mm -hmm. And so, but I decided that I wanted to try it out. And, hmm. and I realized from there that there was just so much stuff still to do out there in the world. Um, mm. The things that they were fighting for at the time, they were fighting to, um, they were fighting for senior high rises and mm. they were fighting for um, racial equality within Dunkirk, New York. Mm. And, and I was, I started to get into it. And once I started to feel like my heart was changing, it was mm. almost like a transformation. One side of me was always you know, people are bad, mm -hmm. you know, and people need to get over themselves. And then you find out, you know, this transformation is that there are a lot of people out there who are in situations and it's not their fault that they're in this situation. There are mm -hmm. some bigger root causes of these situations mm -hmm. that's happening out there. And so um, this is when I found out about this organization called Center for Third World Organizing. Hmm. Um, they're based out of Oakland, California, um, and uh, now they're in different places. But uh, in the day, what they did was they bring people of color from all over the country to learn community organizing skills hmm. and place them in a, a, with an organization so they can continue to enhance their skills on the ground. And mm -hmm. I just thought that was just most one of the most wonderful things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, coming from Dunkirk, New York, and getting to go to Oakland, right. I, okay, that's cool. And right. so, and the program lasted for eight weeks. Hmm. And so we had this opportunity. I started off by working with an organization called Denver Action for a Better Community. Hmm. And that was out of Denver, Colorado. Hmm. And so this was the first time I've ever learned, like, what's a campaign? You know, hmm. you know what is fundraising supposed to look like? You know, what is a membership? And our campaign at the time, we were... Um, looking mm. into lead poisoning in Denver, Colorado. And so mm. we took this um, kind of on a statewide level, but at the same time on a local level. Um, mm. The statewide level being that the Department of Health is um, required to give um, kids under a certain age um, lead poisoning tests, and they mm. weren't adhering to it. Mm. And um, on the other side of it, the housing authority knew that there was lead in a lot of the buildings but, you know, one, they didn't tell folks about it who were moving into the buildings, or mm -hmm. two, didn't have a plan to get rid of the lead. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we successfully 
won that campaign. And wow. um, so we got the, the housing authority to um, do what they were supposed to do and the State Department. They started mm. giving the test. And this is not a good thing to say, but what happened was um, one of the kids tested positive for lead. Mm. And so what in organizing what we call as a handle, mm. right? It's something that you can grasp. And so when one of the kids came up positive, you know, that really gav galvanized the community to, to take more action and, mm -hmm. and work with other, other um, housing authority developments at that time. Mm -hmm. And so that was my experience of my real, what I call my first real mm -hmm. organizing experience and understood, you know, what power is and mm -hmm. why power is important. How can you use your power um, against someone else to be able to get your point across? And so... That so, was a great thing. Yeah. How did you actually get the housing authority, the state or the city to, you know, fix the lead paint and mm -hmm. get them to uh, test the kids? How, what did you actually do? What was sure. the... Well, I mean, well, definitely when that one kid came up positive, that was the big thing that got the people engaged and involved. Mm -hmm. it, took a, it took a lot of door knocking, mm -hmm. um, going around the neighborhood and and letting people know the problem. But the thing that helped us is, I think the first thing that helped us was doing the research, mm -hmm. finding out about lead poisoning. What are the federal regulations around lead poisoning? And I think that we, we found some handles that way as well, smaller handles mm -hmm. that um, we could then take to the neighborhood. But then we started um, using the strategies of bringing people to meetings, right? Mm -hmm sitting down, educating them, what's the situation. Um, and it take, and it's also, it's not about me, it's about everybody in the room making sure that we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so like, we're teaching folks how to run some of the meetings um, right. and teaching them the information and what to say, how to say it. Um, and also we, we're moving forward, but we realized that we weren't getting enough people right away mm -hmm. as fast enough. So we started to do other things to, to build that commitment from our residents, um, our um, constituency who was involved. And uh, we started to have them do what we call um, house meetings. Uh-huh. Great. Yeah. Um, because what we realized that people, you know, they know each other. Mm -hmm. um, they can invite whoever they want to come to the meetings, mm -hmm. and you can, you know, it's, it, it was it was faster than doing a door knock because you get four to six people in a room, right. and you can talk with them for a half hour. Right, they invite their friends. Yes, yeah, right. Right, for their yes. neighbors, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, right, we got them to do that. We got them um, engaged that way, and like we said, then once you have four to six people already engaged. Um, and they went and got other folks so they could have house right, meetings. They're doing it. They're yes. making the food. You're following the iron rule of organizing, never do for people what they, they can, can do, do for, for themselves. themselves. So That's you right. didn't bring the food, I assume. No. No? No. You didn't invite the people. No, they, they invited invite. the people. Right. Okay. Yes. That's, that, yeah. that's real helpful for people mm -hmm. to understand that. Yeah. yeah. One of the other things, too, Michael, that was tough at first, but I think one of the real big lessons I've learned in organizing mm -hmm. is about membership. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, like we said, you know, you, people can do for themselves and right. people know what they can afford as a membership. We, we had dues, $5, you become a member mm -hmm. of the organization. So we started to build an organization. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a name for it. We now having people buy into it. They're not just buying into with the monetary value, but they're buying into the whole process right. of building. And but so the money counts too. They're paying the money, something. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And they're giving something. And and I can tell you, there are a lot of meetings I've been to where people are like, wait a second, you know, I pay my dues, you know, right. and they and they're really they they're really into it. Mm -hmm. And so. So the membership thing was a good thing for mm -hmm. us as we did the campaign. But I think that um, it, it, the, the main thing after that, right, is now coming to the point where you have to think of what kind of action mm -hmm. you're going to take. You know, you're just going to sit there and say, well, 
you know, they're smart, they know what to do, they'll take care of it themselves. Um, they would have done that a long time ago if that right. was the case. Mm -hmm. So um, then we thought about what kind of actions we could do um, as a group, mm -hmm. not, not, not the organizers, you know, saying, right. well, this is the action we're going to do. Right. I've seen that happen before, too, that people mm -hmm. come up with the action before right. and try to bring people in, and then they find out it's the wrong thing. Right, we call them puppet organizers. That's <laughs> part of Small's phrase, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, what we decided to do, of course, we went, we, we, at the time, we were doing direct action, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so we went directly to the uh, health department. Mm -hmm. You know, we asked them, we took our, we made our posters. We were very creative and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. we asked folks just to, um, at the health department, you know, these are the, this is what the law says. This is what the law says you're supposed to be doing. You know, can you, yes or no, um, mm -hmm. and you always get an answer, right? right. Um, can you adhere to the laws around lead poisoning? And um, I think they were so shocked at the time. And plus, the other thing that helped us, too, was you have to have the press in, involved. Mm -hmm. uh, because they, they, they're, they're like, oh, someone's about to get it. Yes, we can go. We're going to go and see this in action. And so mm -hmm. they're there with us. Um, and so we asked that demand, right? Will you uh, make your changes to the law or make your changes to mm -hmm. what's happening right now? Yes or no? And they said yes to all of our demands. Mm -hmm. And so and the housing, I thought it was a little bit different. Uh, because we, I mean, we did go there. We we line up at the office of the uh, the housing authority director. Mm -hmm. uh, he knew we were coming, right? And he did not show up, right? And so somebody in our um, constituency had his cell phone number. Cool. Um, and so we called him on his cell phone, and we we demanded that he show up. He eventually showed up. Right. Um, Interesting. That's great. Yeah. So, but that, but that was kind of how I first got into the work, uh -huh. um, and it just continued on and on. Um, mm -hmm. I went to Sacramento after that and started a group called Sacramento Communities Taking Action for Neighborhood Dignity. We just call it STAND. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I've learned also about, especially when you're building your organization, come up with a, a snazzy name. Right. You know, something right. that people can get into and right. can understand it. You right. Know? And so, understand, huh? And so, we did that. We started doing work around police brutality, mm. um, especially around police misconduct. So, another thing that I've learned throughout the years mm. is a good organizer learns how to organize on a local basis. Mm. They, they can learn how to organize on a statewide basis, and they can learn how to organize on a national basis. Mm. And in, once you've kind of been able to do all three of those, you know, it really helps you to understand the bigger picture because then you realize on a local level there's something nationally mm -hmm. that's um, that having an impact mm -hmm. on folks on a, on a local level. Yeah. Can you think of an example? Like, yeah. Well, sure. I mean, that's the idea around the, the whole thing around police brutality mm -hmm. and um, uh, police misconduct. It's that, you know, you can see it on a local level, but legislation right. at the higher level, like say in the, in the 1990s when it, it came up with the crime bill, mm -hmm. and they thought that that was going to be the thing that mm -hmm. alleviates crime when, you know, what happened was a lot of police officers started having more misconduct. Did we see the whole Rodney King incident? You know, um, I mean, and that was at the turning point of exposing what was already happening on a local level. Mm -hmm. but. The reason why it was it like that because they started to show it on a national level, mm -hmm. um, and then people started to wonder, well, what's happening in our own neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. And so, why that was important for us because we realized that there was a lot of research out there around police officers and what they were doing in neighborhoods and so forth, but no one was like collecting the data mm -hmm. on a on a on a local scale or mm -hmm. on a national scale, and so. Mm -hmm. We, just, we started to do a lot of that research mm. and figured out that it was so important mm. um, for us because now we knew something was messed up nationally, but the people that are hurting the most are the people right there on the streets. Right. So, 
So that, that was another good lesson learned out of this. And so the sacramental time was really spent in learning how to build an organization. Mm -hmm. um, so I already knew how to go out door knock and, mm -hmm. and all of the skills that needed to be an organizer. But the next level, I think, for me growing up was to learn how to keep people within the organization. Mm -hmm. you know, don't come, come up with a, a one-time action mm -hmm. and then let everyone go away. But right. why are we doing this? Because we're building communities. We're building organizations. Now, why is that so important, James? Sure. Uh, it's because people owns it. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice ownership piece to have. Uh -huh. um, and you can identify with the group. You know, you, you then, um, you're able to see the values of mm -hmm. having this, and you have created this together. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of what yeah. happened in uh, mm -hmm. Newark, New Jersey. They, the neighborhood had just built their own plan of what they wanted the neighborhood to look like for five years. Mm -hmm. And so the electric company, the gas and electric company went in and they decided, decided that they were just going to put a switching station in the middle of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. took it to the city council, city council voted on it, mm -hmm. and, but they didn't ask the residents mm -hmm. you know, who just right. came together with this plan and they wanted the, these things to happen. They just built their co cohesion, working together, going around doing the door knocking, getting the neighborhood together, and then mm -hmm. this happened to them. So. Mm -hmm. They went to the Urban, Urban League over there, um, and they uh, came together as a neighborhood uh, association with the Urban League and decided that they were going to challenge this. And they went around, they got petitions from 500 of the neighbors in the wow. neighborhood. And the next city hall meeting, they showed up, and they told them that they would not allow the switching station to be in their neighborhood because mm. it was not part of their plan. They mm. worked almost, and this is our neighborhood. Right. And so that was the thing that they said, and this, is, this was our organization that's going to be the one who was hurt upon this. And they already had an organization. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And so um, it was the Fairmont Heights Neighborhood Association. Yeah. And what are some of the elements that go into building a powerful organization like the Fairmont Heights? I mean, what are, what are the building blocks change. Sure. Um, first off, having that ownership, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and how do you get that? How do you get the ownership? Sure. By letting folks do the work. Mm -hmm. You know, let them come, go out and do the door knocking. You know, for, for me, it was more of just teaching them what mm -hmm. to do. And mm -hmm. once they do it, you know, you sit back with them again. You know, how did that feel? Right. You know, you have to, you know, you have to evaluate. Right. Um, you you let to. them do it and reflect and evaluate. That's right. That's right. And then let them come up with the tasks. You know, we can say these are called tactics. You know, we can say that this is part of a bigger strategy. Right. But, but then, for example, that's what you want to get them to start saying, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, and then the experience of it. If you went through a campaign, you now experience it, mm -hmm. you know, and now you realize that you can tell, tell that story to others. And right, so they it. go down to the city council in Newark and they speak, I assume, yes. not you. Right, right. right. Yes, exactly. And, you know, our job is just to prep them, mm -hmm. you know. We, we sometimes sit down and we ask, you know, well, what if they say this? Right. You know, and do, how are you going to respond? You know, so, it's, so people just think that you just get people together and you just go down and do it. No, but there's, there's, there's a, a, um, a method to it all. Right, mm -hmm. and then, and as you go through the method, you really you start to realize what you what you built. Mm -hmm. Okay, and once you build uh, this, we want to keep it. So let's come up with something like come up with our name, okay, and come up with our mission. You mm -hmm. know, what are we what are we about? Mm -hmm. You know, so when people are, when other folks come in, you know, you know what we're about. You can explain it to folks. Mm -hmm. And you know how to ask them to be involved with the campaign as well. Mm -hmm. so, so what are some of the lessons? You know, you've been doing this now, James, for decades. Mm -hmm. What are some of the overall lessons you would like to communicate, particularly to people 
who are just maybe getting into community and labor organizing? What are some of the key elements you yeah. would boil them down to? Yeah, I think um, if, if I was to do this all over again now that I've grown up, <laughs> right. you know, I, would, I would learn right away um, the neighborhood, the area that you're looking to, to focus in. Mm -hmm. um, that's just as easy as getting in a car or walking the neighborhood and just looking around. What, what are some of the things that make this neighborhood a great neighborhood? What are some of the things that um, we have to still do within this neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And part of that going through a neighborhood, right, is uh, we call it an analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, the but ideal is that maybe you see some kids on the, on the um, corner, you know, go ask them, hey, what's it like in this neighborhood? Mm -hmm. You know, just do some quick data to get a feel for it. And then you go and sit and you assess some more. And, um, right. You ask them an open-ended question. You don't say, do you like it or not? Right. That's you right. ask, like, what's it like? That's real That's important right. how what's you speak like, it. You know, right. um, what do you think about that corner over there? You know, mm -hmm. things like that. Then let them talk. That's right. Two things I've learned. Um, people like to talk. Yep. And two, people like to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think those are important things to remember when you're talking to folks. And, and it's not about you. It's about them. Right. That's key. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And, and how did you learn that? How did you learn that, that it's not about you doing for them, but it's about them? How, how did you learn that and how do you do it? Yeah, I, I think you just have to be out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you, you learn from instinct mm. that once you're out there talking to folks and, mm -hmm. and, um, and you have to have um, what I would say a, a more confidence in yourself as mm -hmm. well. I used to tell folks, I, I like it when I'm talking to folks, I want to feel just as, I want them to feel just as comfortable as, to talk, talking to me as they were talking to their brother or sister. Mm -hmm. and, I was, and so you have, to, you have to learn how to talk to people and be willing to talk to people. You know? mm -hmm. um, being able to just be able to gel with folks. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things, Michael. Um, and then, um, Go along, going along with that, it's just a sh just plain respect. Hmm. You know, some people, and I've seen this even with organizers that, you know, they're just doing it and they're just going through the motions. Hmm. And and sometimes it works, you know. But mm -hmm. the thing is, is that don't lose your own identity, right? Hmm. But just realize that people want to be respected. People hmm. want to be heard. Um, People want you to, um, they want to be involved. You right. know? And I think that we take, and we have to make sure that we don't take our own baggage to the door. That's mm -hmm. one of the things I learned first off. Mm -hmm. You know, knock on that door, three seconds, oh, they're not home. You know, you, you learn how to knock twice or three times, right? Uh -huh. right. Um, but sometimes we go to the door scared. Um, you know, you hear Rottweiler here and there, you right. know, <laughs> right. but, but the ideal is that, you know, you go to the next door and to the next door, right. you know, you, and you have to be persistent. Right. That's another thing. Um, you know, when you're asking people things, you wait for an answer. Okay. Um, and, and, and if you say something, mean what you say. Right. I uh, think these are great lessons. Uh, we've got a and this time, but I, I want to thank you because uh, what you said, listening, respect, going on to the next door, those are all key lessons. And uh, so we were really lucky today to have James Johnson from Sun Consulting in Limerick, Pennsylvania with us. James has been an organizer for decades now and has led and taught and helped people reflect as he described himself uh, many years. So. Um, Again, I'm Michael Jacoby Brown, the host of We Hold These Truths. And uh, today our guest again was James Johnson of Sun Consulting in Limerick, Pennsylvania. And uh, I think if you go back and listen to James's lessons, you'll learn a lot about what it really means to be an organizer. So thank you very much for listening, okay? And hopefully we'll see you again soon.